The country of Ukraine has been in the news a lot over the past 10 years for very unfortunate reasons. This country in Eastern Europe has been the site of political uprisings, war, and disaster. In the early days of 2020, before the current ongoing conflict in the country, Ukrainians woke on January 8th of that year to the devastating news that one of their passenger planes had crashed shortly after takeoff, with the lives of 176 people lost. Plane crashes are rare in the modern day. Well, they've always been a rare occurrence, however, relatively speaking, compared to 30, 40 years ago, they just don't occur as often as they used to, and that is a testament to how far the aviation industry has come in terms of safety. Looking at air travel in the 2020s, pilots and engineers pull from over a century's worth of experience and hard lessons learned. That is why this disaster is so shocking. Ukraine International Airlines Flight 752. There was nothing wrong with this plane. There was nothing wrong with the pilots. There was nothing nefarious stored in the plane's cargo. It was purely external factors that brought this plane down. Given how recent this event was, there is a good chance you may have some idea as to what happened that night. But you see, the category of disaster this falls into is shocking and completely preventable. But it has been known to happen on numerous occasions in the past. And you'd expect that something like this just should not happen in the modern day. But let's look into it and see if we can get to the bottom of it. Let's preface this with saying that this video has been constructed with the aid of a multitude of sources, including multiple reports from the Iranian investigation, international investigators, and independent investigators, alongside numerous other related sources. So with that said, let's uncover the inner workings that brought this event to the disaster it was. It was the very early hours of January 8, 2020. A Ukraine International Airlines Boeing 737 has just landed in Tehran, the capital of Iran. Tehran has two main airports, one a domestic hub, the other an international gateway to the country. Mirabad Airport is located within the city itself. That is the domestic airport, a very crowded and very busy airport, the busiest in the country in fact. Located about 20 miles south of the city center is Imam Khomeini International Airport. That is where our Ukrainian 737 has landed. The airport itself is rather out of the way of the city. It's located within a more sparsely populated region. There are a few smaller towns out here and the occasional military base, but not much else other than the countryside. The crew inbound to Tehran left the plane and checked into a hotel at the airport. A returning flight crew would take over and begin the turnaround process for the return trip to Kiev later that morning. It was going to be a nearly full flight, with a total of 167 passengers traveling on Ukrainian Airlines Flight 752. Ukraine International flew this route into Tehran, not because there was much of a Ukrainian connection to Iran, but rather to serve the international Iranian diasporas. Most of the passengers on Flight 752 would be connecting onto other flights in Kiev, a lot of them heading to Canada. For you see, many of the passengers were either students or academics in Canadian universities. It was the end of the winter break, so some of those with connections in Iran chose to spend that time in their homeland visiting friends and relatives. So for a lot of passengers, this was the first leg of a journey home. Flying them to Kiev was Captain Volodymyr Gapanenko. At 50 years of age, he was highly experienced, logging over 11,500 flight hours by this time. 4,500 of those were in this plane, the Boeing 737. He was also no stranger to Tehran's international airport. He had flown into and took off from here four previous times. His co-pilot sat in the right seat was 48-year-old Serhii Komenko, also a seasoned pilot, though he was less experienced at 7,500 flight hours, and around half of that was in the 737. Also on board was a flight instructor. 42-year-old Alexei Nomkin had 12,000 hours logged in the plane. Additionally, out of all three pilots on board, he had the most experience using this airport. 
He had flown to Tehran a total of 14 times and was well acquainted with this airspace. The plane they were flying was a three-year-old Boeing 737, a plane you, as a viewer, are likely familiar with. If you have ever flown short haul in recent decades, there is a good chance you have flown on one of these. More specifically, this was the 737-800 model. The 800 falls into the subfamily of the 737 known as Next Generation, or NG for short. Though it is a modern plane, it's not to be confused with the more recent Boeing 737 MAX series of planes. Something we'll no doubt have to talk about someday. The Boeing 737-800 was, and honestly still is, one of the best planes around. It has a good safety record, and when Boeing launched it in the late 1990s, they made a number of improvements to it from its predecessors. It features a clear and modern glass cockpit. It's powered by newer engines and has a range of around 3,000 miles, making it even an ideal choice for medium-range routes like Tehran to Kiev. The 737, as you probably already know, has had a turbulent history when it comes to the plane itself whether that be for computerized or mechanical reasons. Also, something else we need to talk about sometime. Ukraine International Flight 752 was delayed getting off the ground in Tehran that morning. They were supposed to leave at 5.15 local time, but would stay at the gate, delayed for just over 40 minutes. According to the investigative reports, the reason for this delay was that the plane was overweight. Some passengers also didn't make the flight, and their luggage needed to be offloaded. Additional cargo was taken off the plane to bring it within safe limits for flight. These delays aside, the pilots were expecting a smooth flight. However, the skies themselves weren't so friendly that night. What is called a Notice to Airmen, or NOTAM for short, was issued by the Federal Aviation Administration in the United States earlier that morning. The NOTAM forbid American carriers from flying over Iran due to, quote, potential for miscalculation. It happened to be that, earlier that night, Iran was involved in some military activity. Rockets were fired from Iran into neighboring Iraq, targeting the Al-Assad base west of Baghdad. This was reportedly in retaliation to a drone strike that killed Iranian General Qasem Soleimani in Iraq just five days previously. The skirmish had raised the threat level between the two countries. Throughout the night, Flights en route over the Middle East began to divert their flight plans. Some planes rerouted, others flat out just turned around. However, something to bear in mind here, the NOTAM was really only for American air carriers. Airlines of other nations did not have to abide by it. Though other countries still took notice and some airlines from international carriers also diverted, Ukraine International Airlines did not change their plans. Now, to be fair to the Ukrainian carrier, other international operators were still choosing to continue their international flights in and out of Iran, including Lufthansa, Qatar Airways, Austrian Airlines, and Azerbaijan Airlines, to name a few. And that's not even to mention the flights that were already en route to Tehran. A lot of those flights weren't cancelled, and wouldn't be even despite the events that would unfold that night. Given what would eventually transpire that morning, Many believe that international carriers should not have continued their journeys into Iran. Some even called it an irresponsible move, saying they should have grounded those planes and flights in, out, and over Iran until the situation was clear and safe. However, above all of that, Iranian authorities, despite the heightened tension between them and Iraq, did not close their own airspace. Something else that would be heavily criticized in the days, weeks, months, and years that followed, but we'll talk more about that later. Despite the situation, the Ukrainian flight out of Tehran continued as it was expected to. Even though this friction all unfolded in the middle of the night, Tehran's Imam Khomeini airport was still business as usual. In fact, though the sun may have been down, the terminal was still busy, as Flight 752 was not the only aircraft leaving Tehran in that early morning. Just looking at Imam Khomeini Airport, between midnight going into January 8, 2020 and the time of the disaster, nearly a dozen flights took off prior to Flight 752's departure. All of those flights left the Iranian capital without issue. 
5.51 local time. First Officer Kamenko gets on frequency to ask for flight clearance. The controller at the Tehran airport sets the plane on standby whilst they send the clearance to the relevant authorities. Unlike most international airports around the world, where the tower can just issue a filed flight's clearances, controllers at Imam Khomeini Airport needed to send the request through various channels. They contacted Mirabad Airport Approach, who then contacted the Tehran Area Control Unit, and then they got in contact with the Iranian Civil Military Operational Coordination Center. They then say, yeah, the plane can leave, send the clearance back to Mirabad Approach, who then gets on the phone back to Imam Khomeini Airport to give the okay. Finally, they can issue Flight 752 its clearance three minutes later at 5.54. It's archaic to do things this way, but it is what was done on that morning. One minute later at 5.55, the airport jetway is detached from the plane and pushback begins. As the plane is being pushed away from the terminal, the pilots begin the engine startup ahead of requesting taxi clearance. Now, the actual physical surface area of the airport is quite large. The airport at the time and currently still has two runways. A third runway to the south has long been under construction. The runway that Flight 752 was to take off from was runway 29 right, the outside runway departing to the west. Eventually, at 6.11 in the morning on January 8, 2020, the engines were powered up and the 737 took to the skies the plane lifting off the ground at precisely 6.12 and 8 seconds. Once in the air, the pilots kept the plane on the runway heading as they contacted the departure controller. At 6.14, as the plane climbed through 6,000 feet, the pilots were cleared to fly direct to the Parrot Waypoint, about 70 miles northwest of the airport. Good morning, here is Khan International 752, radar identity point and departure, climb to level 260. The plane begins a small right turn to line up on this heading. That was the last time air traffic control spoke to the ill-fated aircraft. Meanwhile, on the ground, the plane was being observed. By whom? Iranian military located at a base near the town of Bid Kane, west of Tehran, had picked up the plane on its own air defense radar. Specifically, this was a branch of the Iranian armed forces known as the Islamic Revolutionary Guard. Unknown to the pilots, Ukraine International Flight 752 had just been misidentified as a possible threat. The Islamic Revolutionary Guard had just taken steps to fire two surface-to-air missiles at the plane to shoot it down. So, let's back up and see if we can understand why. Now, there is a bit of conflict with information here. However, there is a common agreement at least that Flight 752 had been misidentified. We should lay it out and see what we've got here. Let's immediately preface this by saying that Iran lied, obfuscated and withheld information pertinent to a factual investigation in this case, including recordings from their military equipment on the night. But here is what they had to say in a 2021 report following an investigation. According to Iran, misalignment, as it was called, of the military radar used by the offending Iranian air defense teams was supposedly found to be improperly displaying radar information. This came about because the equipment itself had been moved that morning amid tensions with Iraq and needed to be recalibrated. Because it wasn't, there was a discrepancy of 105 degrees in the radar headings. So, when Flight 752 appeared on their radar screens, it appeared as if it was heading towards those military bases west of Tehran, and coming from a completely different direction, heading to where they happened to store an arsenal of ballistic missiles. It was what they deemed to be a sensitive military center. But there is more to this part of the story, and this claim is a scenario that not everyone is happy with, and something that other reports suggest is in fact falsified. But it goes on further. It was laid out how there was a risk management procedure in place for military activities in Iran. There was supposed to be joint coordination between the military and civilian branches of the country's airspace. Different airports had varying levels of risk when it came to this sort of thing. 
for flights departing Tehran's Imam Khomeini International Airport, risk was deemed to be low. If you remember, Flight 752, when they got their clearance, needed to have it pass through the coordination center that manages the communication between these two branches of airspace. They concluded, therefore, that there was a breakdown in communication within the Iranian military. Other investigators were of a different opinion regarding the conditions that night. As concluded in the Canadian report, Iran had created the conditions themselves, where a surface-to-air missile operator would shoot down a plane. They did this by anticipating an American response from their previous attack in Iraq earlier that night, positioning anti-aircraft weapons nearby an international airport and placing them on high alert, determining the risk of misidentification in relation to said airport to be low, and insisting on keeping their airspace open. They go on further to say that this falls below international standards for safeguarding air travel in conflict zones. There was, evidently, poor communication between the military and civilian branches of airspace, as no airlines, pilots, or controllers were aware that they were active in that region. This is backed up by an air traffic control recording leaked by Ukrainian media. But we'll come back to this recording later. So, as we've already touched upon, when you ask international and independent investigators, you get differing versions of events, and there is more to be said here. Firstly, if there was any fault or misalignment in the equipment they were using, this should have been picked up and rectified. And this really brings up the rather obvious question of, why did so many other flights that morning leave Tehran without issue? Why was it this time that they saw a passenger plane as a threat? So many weren't really buying that scenario being the only cause here. Depending on who you ask, this was either a systemic problem within the Iranian military like we've already discussed, especially when you consider that the story goes in this case that the missile operator in question had acted independently without supervision or without seeking authority first. Or this was a case of Iran not identifying and differentiating between military and civilian aircraft and targets. Or the plane was actually deliberately targeted, something that many people do believe, including many of the relatives of the victims. According to the report released by the Association of Families of Flight 752 Victims, in their conclusion, Contributing to the toxic conditions that enabled the hostile environment the plane flew into, Ukraine International Flight 752 was shot down in part due to Iran keeping their airspace open as a method of providing a human shield against the country. This is actually one aspect of the disaster that was also touched upon by Canadian investigators. Basically saying, you can't shoot us because you might hit a passenger plane. If that is the case, then Iran has committed a war crime. Now, if you remember, Ukraine International Flight 752 was delayed for nearly an hour. So, as it was flying out west of the airport, it's entirely possible that air defense teams would have checked the local flight schedules and would have found that no plane was expected to be in that region at that time. So, when it showed up on radar, they jumped to the conclusion that it was a threat, possibly an American cruise missile. And here's the thing. There aren't a whole lot of other ways to look at that. This all transpired very quickly over the course of just a couple of minutes. Even though it was now assumed that the plane was hostile, the pilots of Flight 752 had made no mistake or miscalculations in their flight plan. They were flying the same route that many of those previous departing planes had used earlier that morning. Flight 752 was in the specified air corridors and had been given clearance to fly directly to the Parrot Waypoint from air traffic control. This point was even backed up by Iranian air crash investigators. Regardless of what happened here, the key fact remains the same. Action was taken to shoot the plane down, and there was failure to perform a further check to identify the aircraft. And this is another key point here. Flight 752's transponder gave off a signal that would have identified it as a civilian plane. Additionally, they could have checked any one of a number of live flight tracking services and would have seen that this plane was taking off from Tehran. Nevertheless, they mobilized their TOR missile system 
and primed two surface to air missiles for launch. Ukraine International Airlines Flight 752 has been in the air for just over two minutes. It's 6.14, just as the pilots had made that small right turn, the first of two surface-to-air missiles was launched from the ground. It began to soar across the night sky, ascending toward its target. Moments later, it intercepted the Boeing 737 and exploded. When the missile detonated, it did so on the plane's left side, in close proximity to the cockpit and forward passenger cabin. The shrapnel from the thing itself was blasted in all directions facing the aircraft. Tiny holes pierced the plane's skin in countless areas, and it really can't be overstated how much coverage of damage this missile caused. Tiny holes were later found in the wreckage by investigators in various places across the plane. In the tail fin, on the outer fuselage, in the passenger seating, all over the plane. There was initial belief from Ukrainian investigators that the pilots were killed when the missile initially struck. However, the recovered cockpit voice recording, which did record the events in the cockpit for a short time after, revealed that all three of the men in the cockpit actually survived the blast and were believed to have been uninjured at this point. The damage done by the missile had, however, knocked out the aircraft's transponder. In this moment, the flight information pertaining to the aircraft disappeared from radar screens. This included the plane's heading, altitude, airspeed, and the flight's call sign itself, gone off the controller's radar scope. The loss of the transponder is why the radar data seems to abruptly end. As a disaster of the modern day, the plane could be easily tracked by applications and services such as Flight Radar 24, which shows this exact data. The plane climbing away from the airport on the runway heading, the small right turn, before cutting out exactly here, with the final recorded altitude from the transponder being 7,925 feet. However, though transponder data was lost here, this was not where the plane ended up. The plane itself didn't explode from the missile or anything like that. It retained enough structural integrity that it didn't break apart. It actually stayed in the air and continued to fly. In fact, the onboard flight recorders continued to function for a further 19 seconds before eventually failing. According to sources detailing the accounts of those who have listened to the unreleased cockpit voice recording, it's believed the pilots wrestled for control of the plane for as long as they could. The sound of terrified passengers could also reportedly be heard in the background. It's entirely possible they knew what had happened. It may even have been possible for some passengers seated at left side window seats to have very briefly seen the missile. As the plane was still in the air, it could still return a radar echo back to the tower and its blip could still be followed. For around 20 seconds, the plane was kept more or less on its then current heading. Half a minute after the first missile was launched at 6.15 and 9 seconds, the second missile was fired and it's unclear if the second missile had actually hit the plane. Nonetheless, the aircraft was crippled, its ability to fly devastated by the missile attacks. The plane was now on fire and descending. Bystanders on the ground began to capture the stricken plane on their phones, evidence that would help point conclusively towards these events after the disaster. But we'll talk about that later. What came next was a large right turn heading east. The pilots would have found the stricken plane to be very difficult to control. A fire consuming the plane was eating its way through the aircraft systems, burning up the cockpit, consuming the passenger cabin, and weakening the plane's structural integrity. However, because the flight recorders cut out shortly after, and no radio transmissions were recorded, we don't have a whole lot of information as to what exactly was going on in the cockpit of the plane in its final minutes. What we do know is that from the point of conflict with the missile, the pilots managed to keep the Boeing 737 in the air for roughly three minutes after the attack. Heading east, the plane was brought to the southern outskirts of Tehran. In the final moments of the flight, it made another right turn towards a southerly heading. Some have interpreted this as a desperate attempt to get back to the airport. Witnesses on the ground believed that Captain Gaponenko maneuvered his plane with what little control he had left to direct the plane towards a football field away from the lit-up residential buildings. In those final seconds from disaster, the stricken plane passes over the small village of Kalajabad, narrowly missing the homes of residents. 
Moments later, at 6.18 and 23 seconds, the plane crashed. The area the plane crashed into was near to a small park containing that football field on the southern edge of this village, just outside of Tehran. Upon impact with the ground, the plane was obliterated into a countless number of small fragments. Very soon after the crash, emergency services arrived at the scene to find that no one had survived. 176 people on board the flight were now dead. This was the scene of one of the worst disasters to have occurred in Iran, to involve Ukraine, and also involve the Boeing 737. Meanwhile, in the sky, the Ukrainian flight was not the only plane in the region. The pilots of an inbound Iran Azaman flight had just witnessed something unusual from their position. The pilots got on frequency at Mirabad approach to report. What you are about to hear is a conversation between this aircraft and the tower. The recording made its way to Ukrainian media and was leaked on Ukrainian television a month later. You're about to listen into the moment the controller discovers that the plane he spoke to just moments ago has vanished. Rather quickly, the news began to spread that a plane had crashed in Iran. Very soon, it was discovered that it was Ukraine International Airlines Flight 752 that was the lost flight. Right out of the gate, Iran went into damage control mode and attempted to spin a narrative of mechanical or engine failure. Later that same day, 
Iranian authorities had managed to put together a preliminary report outlining some details of the ill-fated flight. Needless to say that right away, internationally, people weren't buying it. The radar data was streamed live for anyone to access. The sudden disappearance of radar data was inconsistent with a mechanical or engine failure scenario. Intelligence reports came through from the United States, Britain, and Canada with evidence to suggest the plane was shot down, but Iran maintained their position. Reports began to surface from locals in the area, especially from where the missiles were launched, that bright lights and flare-like objects were seen streaking across the sky. Then, the videos began to show up. On January 9th, the day after, a video was posted to Instagram from the account Rich Kids of Tehran. This was where the first video emerged. They published this recording depicting the burning plane in the sky in its final moments. Unlike most air disasters we have discussed on the channel, the case of Flight 752 occurred in recent times, in an age where everyone possesses a device with a camera. So, as you can expect, those residents who were awake at that time saw the light, pulled out their phones, and captured the moment. There are a plethora of videos like this, and that's not even to mention the number of other pieces of footage taken from stationary, security, or surveillance cameras. Over the course of the following hours, days, and weeks, more footage from that night would only continue to surface. In this video, the launching of the two missiles was captured on video, pretty much confirming that this was a shootdown event. There was this video that emerged depicting the moment of impact. On January 11th, after three days of denying it, Iran eventually confessed they shot down the plane. Iran, as you might know already, has been no stranger to shootdown accidents especially in the context of mistaken identity. In 1988, one of their own passenger planes was shot down by an American warship over the Persian Gulf, killing 290 people. But how Iran responded after shooting down this Ukrainian passenger plane is nothing short of unacceptable. So, let's talk about it. To begin with, Iran, after they confessed this was a case of mistaken identity, they attempted to justify it by suggesting that Flight 752 was effectively caught in the crossfire of heightened military tension. The citizens of Iran themselves were not happy about the situation. Protests erupted all over Iran in wake of the disaster. There was failure to secure the impact site. It was open for the public to access, which resulted in exactly what you'd expect. Opportunists descended upon the site and took plane parts, personal items from passengers. History shows that this has been known to happen whenever a plane crashes in such open places. Investigators outside of Iran were given access to the site, and it became apparent that the area was purposefully cleared by Iranian authorities, resulting in accusations that Iran was hiding evidence. But they were able to establish the presence of external explosive evidence on the wreckage that was there. Relatives of those who had lost their lives when they began arriving in Iran immediately ran into a multitude of issues. Stories of harassment and abuse from Iranian authorities began to emerge. For example, as you'd expect, many wished to have the remains of their loved ones repatriated back home. Iran made this incredibly difficult. They pretty much wanted to hold on to the bodies. Reports go into detail with how Iranian authorities had been aggressive this included reports that were not limited to harassing victims' relatives in their own homes, demanding that social media posts criticizing the Iranian government's lack of accountability in downing the plane be removed, stalking those in attendance to a vigil, physical assault, and there was even one report of sexual assault. Out of fear for their safety, many had their loved ones buried in Iran. They then took the opportunity to hijack the funerals of the deceased as an opportunity to create propaganda materials. When bodies were repatriated abroad, there were reports that bodies had been looted. Many personal items were found to be missing. Others found that some remains were mixed with that of others, only contributing to further anger against Iran. So what happens now? In the three years since the disaster, there have been a number of attempts to bring those responsible to court. Shortly after the crash, Lawsuits came in from Canada, which is where many of the relatives of the perished reside. In 2021, it was ruled that the shooting down of Flight 752 constituted an act of terrorism. 
There have been more recent efforts from Ukraine International Airlines to hold Iran accountable for the downing of its plane, which is something that has been supported internationally. It is hard to really say what will happen at this moment, but there has been talk about bringing the case to the International Criminal Court, which was backed by the Ukrainian president himself. Now, of course, Ukraine has a lot to deal with right now with the ongoing war with Russia. At this moment, there is great uncertainty about a follow-up. However, in April of 2023, there was a major update out of Iran on the actual individuals who were handling the missile system that morning. Their names and other specific details have not been made public, but it has been reported that 10 people involved in the shootdown, including the operator of the Tor missile system, have been sent to prison where they'll spend at least the next 10 years behind bars in Iran. Although still, Iran has failed to disclose further details, and many are unsatisfied with just the 10-year sentence. There are still many questions unanswered surrounding this tragedy, because Iran is believed to have withheld key factual information about the disaster, many have been left disappointed with the findings of investigations. So given all that we have discussed today, to close, I'll quote the report delivered by the Association of Families of Flight 752 Victims. The Association of Families of Flight 752 Victims believes that Flight 752 was not shot down as a result of human error of one operator, nor was it a consequence of multiple errors in the defense system as claimed by Iran. At the highest levels of military alertness, the government of Iran used passenger flights as human shields against possible American attacks, by deliberately not closing the airspace to civilian flights. The downing of Flight 752 could not have been a horrific combination of some remote coincidences. The intentional act of keeping Iranian airspace open, the technical capabilities of the Tor M1 system and Iran's integrated defense network in detecting hostile targets, the positioning of the Tor system near Tehran's international airport, the systemic concealment of the root cause of the crash, the destruction of existing evidence, and Iran's misleading reports all indicate that the downing of Ukraine International Airlines Flight 752 was deliberate. Hello everyone, thank you so much for watching. Also, thank you for your patience while I produced this video these past couple of weeks. Out of all the videos I have ever produced, I think this one has taken the longest time to make. But even further thanks, there is going to be a lot of thank yous today. Thank you for basically the overwhelming positive feedback to this new, longer video format. Seems like everyone likes this direction and I can't wait to see where we take the channel going forward. With that said, it is time to thank my amazing patrons over on Patreon for their ever-growing, generous support to the channel. Their names are on the screen right now, so if your name is here, thank you, massive thanks to you. Shout out this week to Gareth Molyneux and Brittany Banasik who pledged at the mid-tier. You guys are awesome, thanks. Additional shout out to Andrew Pilecki, I hope I said that right, who increased their pledge last week. Thank you so much. Big shout outs and thanks go out to Gary Jones and Susan Lee, who both pledged at the highest tiers this past fortnight. Thank you so much, total legends. If you yourself would like to support the channel further, you can always join the Disaster Breakdown Patreon from just one pound per month, and the link to that will be in the pinned comment below. All patrons get early access to all new content two days before they are published here on YouTube. That is all from me today. I have my next video that is lined up, ready to be made, so I must leave you and get cracking on with that. Have a great day, and I shall see you next time. Goodbye.